open your Bibles to uh, Psalm 24. Uh, we're on Psalm 24 today. Uh, the first verse says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. And here we see uh, the, um, that the Lord has the ownership of the earth, of the whole world. And uh, the Apostle Paul quotes this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 26, in reference to the uh, Corinthian believers who had been saved from paganism and idolatry. And some practical matters had come up with respect to um, eating certain meats and foods that had been dedicated to idols because they were living in a very idolatrous society. Uh, the whole structure of the society of the world of that time was built around idols and so on. And basically what the, the apostle instructed them was when you go into the marketplace or you're invited to dinner, you don't ask questions as to whether if the food was um, you know, offered to idols, just simply eat it in faith with thanksgiving. Everything is clean. Everything is pure. It's all the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to an idol. And if we have that faith, then that faith will be blessed. You can partake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Another thought in connection with this is that in the ownership of the world is in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews chapter 1 that he's the heir of all things, that he owns all things, all things belong to him, all things actually will be given to him again uh, as man. But they were his by right because he's the creator. And, and because he's the creator, all things belong to him, obviously. Uh, but it says also in the Bible that he has purchased the world. He's bought the world. And we want to be um, uh, clear here because there are some uh, distinct words in connection with the world, word purchase or bought, especially in connection with the world. Not everyone is redeemed by the blood of Christ, only those that believe in him, that have received him as Lord and Savior. But, you know, everyone in the world has been bought by him. The whole world has been bought by him, by his blood. But that doesn't necessarily follow that they're all been redeemed. Redeemed, the word for redeemed in the original Greek has the idea of bringing out, of setting free, of being taken out of the slave market, that type of thing, and being loosed. Uh, but the other word simply means like the ransom price, the price that was paid, that it was purchased or bought. And for example, you have in Second Peter, uh, when in the, I believe it's the second chapter, where he's talking about the apostates in the last days, it says that they will deny the Lord that uh, bought them, that the false pro they were false prophets, actually, Second Peter chapter 2. They deny the Lord that bought them. Well, he bought them. He didn't redeem them, but they were bought. Uh, they were purchased. They belonged to him. Just like in Matthew chapter uh, 13 and the parables of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, you have the, the treasure that was in the field, and the man bought the field so he could take out the treasure. Therefore, he, he bought the field, he paid the price for the field that he might redeem out of the field those that belong to him. And uh, so we could give other examples as well. We've all been bought by the Lord, but only some of us have been redeemed by him. And then it says in verse 2, For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods, speaking of the creation of the world, of planet earth. And then we get this question asked in verse 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in this holy place? And then certain moral features are brought before us. Verse 4 and verse 5. You know, a pure heart and has not lifted up his soul in the vanity. We have a very similar uh, psalm in Psalm 15. Or a similar question. Who will stand in the Lord's tabernacle? But we get those in a future day who will stand in the hill of the Lord. Verse 6. This is the generation of them that seek him. That seek thy face, O Jacob. Salah. There will be a generation from amongst the Jews that will stand in the hill of the Lord. Because the hill of the Lord here, dear friends, is not uh, anything other than Jerusalem uh, and uh, and the nation of Israel, but very particularly um, uh, the city of Jerusalem and, I believe, in the future uh, millennial temple uh, is, is what the uh, prophet, uh, I believe, David here is speaking of. And, you know, it says in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 11, verse 12, as, as far as the Holy Land is concerned, as far as Israel, the nation of Israel is concerned, the land itself, his, it says his eyes, the Lord's eyes, are continually upon it, day and night, and they still are. So we see the future, gener uh, uh, future generation, the godly remnant of Israel, 
uh, they will stand there. But then we see another person who will stand there. And we get that in verse 7. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the King of glory. And he will enter in those gates in a future day. After he returns to earth, he will stand on the Mount of Olives and he will enter into those gates. Now, these verses, verse 7 to 10, has been traditionally interpreted by the church in past years over the generations to speak of heaven that, uh, and to speak of Christ entering into heaven at the ascension. Maybe an application can be made of that. But we're not talking about heaven here. We're talking about the earth. We have that in verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the holy hill of the Lord is not in heaven. It's on earth. So we have to be careful not to spiritualize these psalms and, and these prophecies. And, and the question is answered, asked and answered. It's asked in verse 8, verse eight who is the king of glory? It's answered in verse 8 also. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle, you know, he'll come in great power and glory. He'll, uh, he'll take the beast and the false prophet and cast them alive in, into the lake of fire, and he'll, into the pit. And the uh, armies uh, of, of the beast and the false prophet, he'll, he'll destroy the armies of the nations. Then it says in verse 9, lift up uh, your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. You see, when the Lord Jesus is back on earth and, and that uh, millennial temple is rebuilt, he will enter into those gates. We believe that this psalm perhaps was written uh, it, when, the, when David carried the ark up to Jerusalem, may have been. Uh, we're not 100% sure. But the Lord Jesus is both the ark and the son of David. And he will stand there and he is the king of glory. We see that it's Jehovah, the Lord of hosts. He's the king of glory. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord Jesus is Jehovah. And if I may put in a little plug, so to speak, for a book of mine, my first book that I've written is called Jesus is Jehovah. If you're interested in getting it, you can get it through Believer's Bookshelf Canada or Believer's Bookshelf uh, USA. And it looks at all the verses that show that the Lord Jesus Christ is Jehovah. So who is this King of Glory? It's the Lord. It's Yahweh. It's Jehovah, strong and mighty in battle. And he will enter in through those gates. He'll enter in through that door on the holy hill of Zion. Because he will not just reign over the heavens. He will reign over the heavens with the church. But he'll also reign over the earth through Jerusalem and through the restored remnant of the Jews on the earth. So how wonderful to see these prophecies in the Psalms. Remember, the Psalms are, are prophetic and they're written by the Holy Spirit of God. May the Lord bless you today, my friends.